Every single week, I look forward to talking to Mark Teixeira because he's a delight. But I've got incredible things I want to ask him that I'm curious to see what a big league ball player says. Because what we say, we've never been in the arena like that. So he's going to give us the real take. So, Mark, welcome to the show. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Michael. I'm always, always happy to be here. All right. Would you want Manny Machado as a teammate? If Manny Machado rakes and plays hard, yes. I don't mind some of his other antics every now and then. Nobody's perfect. I don't mind it. But if you have a, a teammate who admits that he's not going to play hard all the time and, you know, he has some good seasons, has some okay seasons, takes weeks off at a time, you know, um, just disappears for, for a month during a season, I don't want that Manny Machado. I want the guy who's an all-star that plays hard and, and wants mm -hmm. to be a winner. But you don't know which one you're getting. Exactly. And, and you're going to have to put $40 million a year into it. Exactly. I would be very cautious if I'm any team that wants to win a World Series or wants Manny Machado to be the, the face of my franchise. I would be very cautious before I make that type of investment. Now, what's so unique about it is we've seen guys not hustle before. And usually they'll either say, listen, I'm not busting it down the line in a game in April when we're up 4 nothing. I don't want to get hurt on a meaningless play where I know I'm going to be out. Or they'll fight that they actually did hustle and you just looked at it wrong. I've never heard a guy like Machado say, I know I should do it. I know it's a bad optic. I just can't. I've never heard that before. And, Don, in the playoffs, this is insane. <laughs> yeah. This is – I cannot believe what I've seen this playoff run for Manny Machado. Here's a guy on a team that's got a chance to win a World Series for the first time since 1988. He's playing in a huge market. He's playing for a $300-plus million contract, and he admits that he's not hustling and he's not really a hustling kind of guy. That's insane to me. Uh, you you would you would think that his agent would have prepared him to just say you know what just for a year just give me one year and then go back to what you are but uh, you, one thing that you got to give him credit for he's being honest you, nobody could say he hoodwinked us. I, I guess, Michael, I mean, you're, you're being very kind. And, and listen, I don't want to beat up on Manny Machado. Everyone, listen, we're all emotional human beings. We all go through some stuff. You know, uh, it's difficult being traded in the middle of a pennant race, and he's probably got a lot of things on his mind right now. That being said, if, if he's going to be the centerpiece of your franchise, your franchise-type player, I don't know if I want young players coming up and looking at Manny Machado as, you know, my leader, as the guy that is supposed to be the, the flag bearer of my franchise. And I hear all these comparisons to Alex Rodriguez and, oh, he's the next Alex Rodriguez. No, he's not. Alex is much better, was a much better player at this point in his career. Look at the numbers. Alex never one time dogged it on the field. Alex, you never talked about Alex being a dirty player or a guy who, who didn't hustle or didn't play hard or didn't want to win. And so what type of player are you getting if you sign him to a huge 8- to 10-year type contract? All right, now th this, is, um, this is, uh, will be a tough question for you to answer. You had a similar player that was your teammate. Uh, an otherworldly talented player in Robinson Cano who, who did not run hard to first base a lot. Did that bother the team? Did you guys ever address it? Was it an issue within that room? No, it was never an issue with Robbie because Robbie always played hard when it mattered. And, and that's why I say we're all human beings. In a, in a nine to one game in May, and you, you hit a routine grounder to second base that's a left handed hitter, yeah, sometimes you dog it down the line. But if the game was on the line, or it was the playoffs, or it was you know, um, you know, a situation where Robbie could, could beat out a double play, he ran hard every single time. We never, I mean, we noticed it now and then, but it was never a, a big deal in the clubhouse or never something that we had to address because we knew when push came to shove, Robbie came to play and he was prepared and he was going to hustle when it mattered. I, I talk, I, I've mentioned this a lot this week, and I don't want to tip my hand of, of, you know, give somebody a clue of who it is, but it, it's a coach and or manager that, that, you know, a former coach manager who said it's a lot more difficult to police these sort of things because players don't police themselves anymore. In the past, they did. Now it's up to the manager or the coach, and there's very little respect for the manager or the coach because the big money guy 
knows he's going to be there longer than the manager or the coach and has more leverage. Do you believe that the day is done when a player can police a, a room and go up to a guy like Manny and go, this has to stop? You know what, Michael? We're getting close. I, I don't disagree with that statement at all. Um, you know, we, we watch these games together here at ESPN at, at Baseball Tonight, and, you know, we have, we're ex-players, we're ex-managers, and we're, and we're um, you know, guys that have been doing, you know, baseball coverage for 20, 30 years. And all of us shake our heads at some of the things that we're seeing. And I don't want to be, I've only been out of the game for two years. So I saw the last few years of my career, I saw um, players, you know, whether it be, be veteran players or managers or coaches losing control over the the um, the habits of young talent that come up. And everyone kind of said, hey, this is how he prepares or this is how he performs. Leave him alone. And we've just been told for the last few years to leave young, talented players alone, no matter how much they don't you know, uh, work hard, how much they don't hustle, you know, what they do on social media. Hey, just leave them alone because that's who he is. Wow. And I don't know if it's, it's the right thing for baseball right now. How would you have reacted, Mark, on the play at first base if Machado kicked you? Did you think it was a dirty play? How would you have reacted? Absolutely. I've never had one time in my entire career that I thought somebody, you know, maybe kind of put a spike into me at first base, and it was a player coming back on a tag up. And as soon as he did it, he knew he should have done it and apologized. And so, you know, was, you know, no big deal. We kind of, you know, bump fists, whatever. It was all good. Never in my career did I have anybody do what Manny Machado did. Mm. If if I'm on first base there, there's, you know, I'm I'm never really a fighter, but out of it reacted exactly how Aguilar reacted. Like, what in the heck are you doing? There is zero reason for that. And I thought Manny Machado should be suspended. Like, why is that allowed? I mean, we've talked about, you know, headhunting from pitchers, and why is this stuff allowed? That, that was completely egregious, and, and in a playoff game, I thought a message should have been sent. All right, let's stay in that series. Council takes out Wade Miley after five pitches. Did he violate any unwritten rules by messing up the lineup for the Dodgers by doing that? No, I actually liked it. I really when it when it first happened, we were all saying, "What is going on here?" But then me and John Farrell were talking about it, like, "Hey, I, I actually like the gamesmanship here because you got counsel that is you're getting matched up left and right with with the Dodgers lineup, and Dave Roberts is is playing a certain." lineup against lefties and a certain lineup against righties, and he is sticking to his book. So Council's saying, you know, let me try to flip a little bit of an advantage. You know, I, I think the Dodgers have a better team, you know, for a seven-game series. Let me try to flip the script here and, and throw out my lefty and let, so they can stack righties in their lineup, and then I'm just going to take them out after one batter and bring in a right-handed pitcher for the next four innings. Now, it didn't work. So, you know, the reason – they won the game and the Dodgers won the game because Clayton Kershaw dominated. But I didn't mind the move at all. I actually thought it was pretty clever on Council's part. All right, let's, um, let's move on to the last night's game, Red Sox and the Astros. And I admitted this at the beginning, and you, you were around me for all the years. With the, I love baseball. It's not just my job. I love to watch it. And I had to go to bed in the top of the eighth inning. I'm sorry, I did. Mm. And I, this is somebody who loves it. I'm not a casual fan. So what exactly is the answer? You know what? I've I've actually talked to Rob Manfred about this, and there's no good answer. So so you say, okay, well let's make the games earlier so kids can watch it. Okay, well you make the games earlier so kids can watch it. They can't watch it on the West Coast, you know. And and who's to say that kids during a school week anyway? I mean, my kids. I know my kids have sports and my kids have homework. Who's to say if you had a you know five o'clock East Coast game on you know a Wednesday night that kids would watch it anyway? But how about a so seven o'clock start? I mean, if you can, forget about kids. A fifty-seven-year-old adult with a job—it's going to be hard for him to stay up. I, I hear you, Michael, but there's there's really no good answers here. Well, I mean, you you. you you are at the mercy of the TV ratings, and the TV ratings are going to show you when the game is supposed to start, and it's just the way it is. See, I wonder if it's about the pregame, because they invest so much money in the pregame show, they don't want to air it at 6.30, where it's going to be 3.30 in California, and lose an audience, because I'll tell you, I'd rather sacrifice, a big baseball fan like I am, 
I'll sacrifice the la the first three innings for the last three. You know, if I got to watch, and I stayed up, and I, it's costing me now because I'm exhausted, but I stayed up to one fifteen in the morning to watch that game because I love baseball and it was very intriguing, I'd sacrifice the first five innings of that game to be able to watch the end of it. So why are we, why are we sacrificing the end, the compelling, the things that people are going to remember and for for the first three innings that may not be nearly as intriguing. I'd rather watch the end than the beginning. You're right, Don, and I agree 100% with you. I mean, I, I enjoy playing golf, and, and what I'll do a lot you know, during the, this playoff run, if I'm not working at ESPN, I'll go play golf in the afternoon, and I might miss a few innings of, of one of these games, but I'm home by the 6th or 7th. And then I can watch. If it's a nine to one game, who cares? I mean, you know, that's that's really not going to be a story. And someone probably hit a bunch of home runs early in the game, and and not you're not really going to cover it that much anyway. But if I come home in the sixth or seventh inning and it's three to two, and you're into the bullpens and you're matching up, and you have these you know guys throwing a hundred miles an hour and, and trying to scratch a hit here and there, that's compelling baseball. So maybe that is the answer, Don. Maybe the answer is start the games early so people can watch the ends of them because that's when you really want to be locked in. What do you think about the Altuve call? I could see that call both ways. I mean, up and down the, the, the spectrum of arguments. I've heard 20 arguments that I agree with on one side, 20 arguments I agree on the other side. The fact of the matter is, and this is what I go back to, as a baseball player, I believe that Mookie Betts was going to catch that ball. And so... As a just strip away the rules, strip away Joe West and replay and all of the technicalities, I thought Mookie Betts made an unbelievable play to get to that ball. I thought he was going to catch it. So in the end, for me, it was the right call. And it's, it's, the one thing that I take exception to, I see, I thought it was a home run. But I, I can't kill Joe West on this. Now, I don't think Joe West is a great umpire, but I think he made the best call he could possibly make in real time. I do, too. We put our umpires in a very difficult situation right now with replay in that, listen, there are umpires that are going to miss calls even if they're right on top of the play. And when you're out in, in right field, you're not going to be on top of a play. I mean, it's you, you kind of have a weird angle from the right field line, and, and someone's jumping, and there's, there's you know, fans reaching in. I mean, even if Joe West was right there on top of it, it was going to be tough to make this call. And then we slow it down into these, like, microseconds on high-definition TV and say, oh, look, there you go, of course. Of course, there you go. How did Joe West miss that? Well, it's it's not easy. There's there's a reason right. we have replay, and you know I, I I think overall our umpires do a great job. I really do. Now Angel Hernandez last series had a terrible game. It happens, right? But overall, Joe West, I'm not going to beat him up either. He made the call that he thought he saw, and in the end, it, you know, it was a toss up anyway. Now this is a shame, but it's a fact is that Joe West is 65 years old, and nobody's going to confuse him with Jack LaLanne. And he's got to run all the way out there to the outfield to make a call. I mean, are we putting these umpires in the best situations? Is, is it asking too much to have you know a guy what? that age be yeah. able to, to, to make that kind of call, you know, trying to charge down the mound, to charge down the line like that? Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. That's. I think there's a lot of politics that go into who you know who is an umpire in, in big games or big series, whatever it might be. But I do not like the fact that if there's not irrefutable evidence, you can't overturn a call. Like, why don't we just go to replay and make the call that we think happened? Like, replay should be should stand on its own. It shouldn't be, oh, well, the call in the field was this, so if there's not indisputable evidence, we can't overturn it. I don't, I don't think that's right. I think that the, the replay system is much better than our naked eye in real time, and so we might as well just rely on the replay and say, okay, Okay, based on the replay, this is the call, and I'm going to stick with it. All right, let me give you a couple of text messages. Um, Joshua Compatello uh, says he's from beautiful Genesee Beer Brewing, Rochester, New York. Text, Strong name, too. If Yankees let CC go and only add one elite frontline starter without adding Machado or Harper, can they win the division or a championship in 2019 with the lineup as is? Yes, they can. But would I feel better about 
the, the team adding a few pieces? Absolutely. And I still believe if the Yankees got hot in that Red Sox series, they could have easily beaten Boston. But you know, what wins in a one-month-long playoff marathon is good teams top to bottom. Look at the Boston Red Sox right now, up three games to one against the defending world champion Houston Astros. Starting pitching, solid. Middle relief, solid. I mean, Kimbrell hasn't been that great, but he's, he's – you know, finding a way to get it done. They're not hitting a ton, ton of home runs, but they're getting on base, getting big hits. Their defense is spectacular. So top to bottom, everything that you need from a team, they're executing. And what, I, what, I, what worries me about the Yankees as they are currently constructed is they rely so heavily on the long ball. They don't have a ton of great starting pitching, so they rely very heavily on their relievers, and they don't play good defense. So you put all of those factors into a month long uh, you know playoff series or, or at least you know even the regular season you put all that together I think there's some holes in the team still so I think Brian Cashman is going to be very busy this offseason um, let's see uh, Chris Lucas from Clifton goes what is your favorite place to travel during the offseason Ooh, I gotta go. I go to the Bahamas. I have a house uh, in uh, in the Abacos. It's cold up here in Connecticut in the winters, as you guys know. I like to get out. I'm a warm weather guy. Try to get out of the cold weather as much as I can and uh, go down in the sun and play some golf and hang out on the beach with my kids. All right. Now there there was an interesting story by Kevin Kernan in the Post today that the Dodgers have have gotten away from their trying to hit home runs. Because they're shortening up, they're going up against the shift just to get base runners because it's a short series. Seems like the Yankees don't do that, and they haven't done that for a couple of years. You think the Dodgers are doing the right thing? I think the Dodgers are doing the right thing, and whether it's a conscious effort or not, they realize that against some really good Milwaukee relievers, they have to shorten up. That's the one thing. You know, when you throw 95 to 100 miles an hour, long home run swings don't play. What plays is, is short contact swings, and you know, whether it's hitting the ball the other way, that's irregardless of where you're hitting the ball, you've got to shorten up and make contact. And I think that's one thing that the Yankees um, you know, probably can get better better at is that, hey, you know, the game plan has to be with, with their, their big home run hitters. Hey, listen, guys, you know, this may not be the night to go f- to swing for the fences. Let's shorten up just a little bit. Let's hit some line drives around the yard and see if we can score some runs that way. Good stuff, Mark. As always, we'll talk to you next Thursday. All right, guys. Enjoy the game tonight. All right. That is Mark Teixeira.